the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Chain Reaction. Johnny Turner was packing his suitcase, but mentally he was tearing up his train ticket to Chicago. It had been several years since Johnny used to wonder, while barnstorming the country, if his mind was playing tricks on him, if Diana could really be as beautiful as the image of her that clung to his thoughts like adhesive. When he came back, he found that Diana was everything he dreamed of and more. She was not only as beautiful, she was married. She had everything that money could buy, but still she kept coming around to see him, still as approachable as a park bench. Now, as she sat on his bed in the cheap rooming house, watching him pack, he realized all over again how close love is to hate, as close as the two sides of his last thin dime. So you're leaving, Johnny, huh? You catch on quick. Just to avoid me, is that it? Where are you going? Traveling. I got a road job selling song sheets and razor blades. If I work hard, they'll put me on buggy whips. Any more questions? Johnny. Johnny, darling. Go away. I'm not in the market. Johnny, why don't you stop pretending? You still love me. You know you do. I said go away. You depress me. You need me, Johnny. I need you like I need three thumbs. <laughs> you really don't mean that. Try me again. All right, all right, Johnny. Have it your way. I'd just drop by to see if you'd be interested in a job. I have a job. This one pays a lot of money. Then my income tax would be too high. No. A lot of money. Just fly a plane. Who's? If you're interested, you can get all the details tonight. It's a nice setup, Johnny. And temporary. Like everything else. Are you interested? Yeah. Oh, Johnny. In the dough, sweetheart. You're so eager. But then you always were. I don't ever remember you throwing rocks at me, darling. Uh, where do I get the details? How about Mike's Cafe for dinner? Do you have enough money to get your pants pressed? Yeah, sure. Maybe both legs. Oh, here, Johnny, take this. I told you before, I don't need any handouts. Stop being so touchy. You won't get this job if you come looking like a tramp. If I get the job, who will I be working for? My husband. Oh, your husband, huh? What are you up to, Diana? Well, nothing. Nothing at all, darling. See you tonight. Bartender. Yeah? That clock ride? Sure. What's the matter, Pat? Your girlfriend send you? No. Maybe your husband did. Huh? Give it. Give me another bourbon and water. Yeah. And send it over to our table, will you, bartender? Yeah, yeah, sure, lady. Sure. Hello, Johnny. Uh, this is, uh, Frank. Sorry we kept you waiting, Turner. Oh, that's all right. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who are always waiting for somebody and those who keep you waiting. You just uh, made that up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get better as the evening goes along. Uh, 
shall we go to our table, gentlemen? Sure. Ah, uh, Walsh, my bar bill, take care of it, huh? I left my wallet and my other suit. <laughs> you do get better as the evening goes along, don't you? Somehow you hadn't pictured Diana's husband this way, had you, Johnny? A bald, red-faced, chubby little man with bright, beady eyes. Thin, moist lips that seem to be fixed in a perpetual grin. He keeps sizing you up all through dinner, asking question after question. You become slightly annoyed. Look, Walsh, are you going to write the story of my life or give me a job? Now, don't be that way, Johnny. Naturally, Frank has to know a few things before... I thought she'd given him the build-up. She has, Turner. Diana is quite certain you'll be able to do the job. Uh-huh. You haven't told me yet what the job is, Walsh. Now, there are three parts to it. One, you do as you're told. Two, you keep your mouth shut. Three, you fly a plane. Mm-hmm. How much does the third part pay? It's not piecework. The whole job pays five grand. It won't take us more than three weeks to complete the job. Five grand is a lot of dough for three weeks. Keep talking. You'll be working for the Continental Salvage Company. What are you going to salvage? Gold. Well, that sounds like nice work. The money in it? We're in business to salvage gold from the ocean bottom. Now, take a look at this. Oh, a map. <laughs> Just like in the movies, huh? Uh, this area here, Cuba, Jamaica, during the war, several ships went down here. They were carrying large shipments of gold. Most of the gold is still there. Most of it? I don't recall hearing about it. A lot it. of it has already been salvaged. You don't hear about it because the government has a habit of demanding a rather large cut in the profits. So most of the salvage work has been kept quiet. However, we're going down there after the gold on a big scale, legitimately. Uh-huh. Big business. We're a stock corporation, Turner, with half a million dollars invested capital. Okay. Where uh, does my job come in? Your job is to scout the area ahead of the salvage vessel, and the only way to cover that much water is with a plane. What do you say, Johnny? Do you want the job? Okay, Walsh. You just bought yourself a pilot. <laughs> Even for $5,000, there's something about this deal you don't like, Johnny. And the following day, when you see the Queen Oriana, the ship chartered by Continental Salvage Corporation, you like it even less. An old, broken-down tub, built back in the 90s as a yacht, now part of a small fleet of fishing boats. There's nothing left of her bright work, and the varnish is all peeled off her rotting mahogany. She doesn't look safe enough to sail in a fish pond. The last thing to go aboard her is the plane you're to fly. A trim, sleek-looking cabin cruiser fitted with pontoons. You look her over very carefully, don't you, Johnny? And you notice the extra gas tank. And you also notice that the plane is without radio. As you slip out of the plane and jump down to the deck, Walsh comes towards you. Well, what do you think of her, Turner? She'll do. Think she's good enough to fly nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico? Gulf of Mexico? You ought to brush up on your geography. My geography's all right. And your sense of direction is not so good. We're not going that way. Answer my question. Okay. If you want to fly the Gulf of Mexico, I guess she'll oblige. But I wouldn't figure on setting her down in the water. The Gulf can get awfully nasty at times. In bad weather, this plane wouldn't last an hour. I said uh, nonstop, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, that's what you said. You watch him as he waddles down the deck and disappears into his cabin. And you wonder about his sudden interest in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, there's something about all this you don't like. And then, just before you sail that night, while Walsh is below decks, you meet Diana. Her eyes are glazed with the sweet sorrow of parting. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Diana. When you come back, Johnny, I'll be waiting for you. You said that the last time, remember? Don't you think I know what a terrible mistake I made? I think saying goodbye is a sort of pastime with you. Some women enjoy crocheting or tatting. It's not too late, Johnny. When you come back, we'll have enough money to go away together. If we do come back according to plan, your husband will still be able to outbid me. But I love you, Johnny. I may decide to stay in Cuba. You won't. Because you love me, you know you do. No matter where you go, you will always come back to me. 
You know something, Diana? What, darling? You're so right. The way I feel about you is like a disease. Oh, Johnny. I'll come back. Without him? What did you say? If... If anything happened to him on the way back and... An accident... You'd be sitting pretty, wouldn't you? All that dough. We'd be sitting pretty, darling. And we'd never have to say goodbye again. This would be the last time. The last time, Johnny. Well? Who knows? Accidents do happen. With the prologue of Chain Reaction... The Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now a word to you drivers. If you want to keep performance up and wear down during the months of hard summer driving ahead, it's time to see your signal dealer now for a spring changeover from winter-weary lubricants. Costly transmission and differential gears need the protection of fresh summer weight signal gear lube. For limbering up the chassis, there's no spring tonic like a signal double-check lube job. And, of course, your motor should be drained and refilled with fresh motor oil. Wait a minute. Did I say motor oil? Well, don't you say motor oil. Be sure you say signal premium compounded motor oil. For signal premium is the improved type lubricant that far outperforms the finest regular motor oils money can buy. You see, because Signal fortifies 100% pure paraffin base with scientific compounds, Signal Premium does more than just lubricate. In fact, tests prove Signal Premium actually keeps motors six times cleaner and reduces cylinder wear one-third, your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. But remember this, only Signal service stations have Signal Premium compounded motor oil. A mighty good reason, I'd say, why there's just one place to take your car for this spring's changeover. Your neighborhood signal service station. And now, back to the whistler. You could hardly ask for a better job, could you, John? $5,000 to fly a plane for the Continental Salvage Corporation in the Caribbean. The work is easy and the opportunity unlimited. Yes, unlimited, John. If anything should happen to Walsh, an accident, you and Diana, his wife, would be sitting pretty. The boat goes out on the 11 o'clock tide that night. On the second day out, you discover the ship is off its course and you hurry to find Walsh. There's no answer from his cabin. As you turn and start down the deck, you run into the mate. Hey, you seen anything of Mr. Walsh? Well, look, you don't have to talk my ear off. Just answer yes or no. Listen, you're the mate on this tub. We're way off our course. I tried to tell the captain, but he's so drunk we'll be in Madagascar before he straightens out. Why don't you answer me? What's the matter with you? He stares at you stupidly, then walks away without a word. Yes, that's something else you'd notice. There's something strange about the crew, isn't there, Johnny? There are six Chinese who sleep below decks. None of them speaks English. The cook is a Korean, and his conversation consists of a wide grin. The three deckhands are fresh out of Portugal. The mate is a sullen German. And the captain lies in his bunk in a drunken stupor. There isn't a man in the entire crew you can talk to. But wait, you've forgotten the radio operator. Quickly, you hurry to the radio shack. You find him at his table, a kid, a gangly kid with a shock of red hair that keeps falling down over his forehead, and he looks nervous, frightened. My name is Turner, Johnny Turner. I'm the pilot for that plane on deck. Mine's Scott, Melvin Scott. They call me Scotty. <laughs> Glad to know you. Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to check the time from Arlington. Oh, sure. It'll be on a few minutes. Uh-huh. I was just writing a letter to my kid's sister in Scranton. Thought I might get it in the mail when we put in somewhere. <laughs> You're not exactly an old sea dog, are you, Scotty? No, uh-uh. No, it's my first job. You like it? I don't know. I I want to make good and all that, but... You send our position in lately? Mm, yeah, a couple hours ago. Mr. Walsh gave me the message. There it is on the spindle. Can I look at it? Sure. Uh-huh, I thought so. What? 
What's the matter? Well, this is all wrong, kid. We're not within 200 miles of this position. What? Yeah. Oh, this is all beginning to add up. Have you taken a look at that diving equipment on deck? Yeah, yeah, I kind of wondered about that. It doesn't look so good to me. I wouldn't wear it in a bathtub. I hate to think of anybody using that stuff. Maybe no one was ever supposed to use it, kid. What do you mean? Maybe this whole trip is a phony. A broken-down tub that's a cinch to go to pieces before we reach the Caribbean, moth-eaten diving equipment, a crew that doesn't speak a word of English, and... Look, kid. Yeah? You better report our correct position. Well, gee, I... I've figured it out, Scotty. I know exactly where we are. Well, look, Mr. Turner, I, I don't want to get into any trouble. You I... will if you don't do as I say. I didn't know that stuff I was sending was phony. Well, you do now. Okay, kid, what'll it be? Well... All right, Mr. Turner. Good. Get on the key and start sending, Scotty. I'll give you... <laughs> You turn around to find Walt standing in the doorway, his eyes wild, red-rimmed, the gun trembling a little in his pudgy hand. Come on, Turner. We're getting out of here. He was just a kid. Why did it's you have to... It's very sad, I know. Now, come on. The poor, dumb, innocent I kid... I said, come on. We're going for a little airplane ride, Turner. Time you started earning your money. On deck, you find the crew ready to set the plane overside with a cargo boom. Walsh holds a small black valise in one hand, waves the gun in the other, shouting orders. Then the two of you climb into the plane. A few minutes later, you're gathering speed like a roller coaster, the waves slapping at the pontoons, and then slowly she lifts. You climb to 3,000 feet and level off. The gun in Walsh's hand is still in your back. You can put the gun away now, Walsh. Keep flying. Where to? A few miles north of Tampa. My wife will be waiting there, on the beach. And after that? Mexico, across the Gulf. Think you can make Veracruz? That depends. On what? When do I get the five grand? When we land in Mexico. You expect me to believe that? Why not? Don't you trust me? Look again, friend. I'm not a stockholder. What do you mean? Didn't take you long to pack that valise. How much is in it? All the assets of the Continental Salvage Corporation? (laughs) Like Diana said, you're a smart boy. Almost half a million. That's a lot of fish to feed to the sharks. Shark? Yeah, look down there. Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. Makes me dizzy. As long as we're both in this plane, anything that happens to me happens to you. Throw the gun away. Sorry. Come on, Walsh. Which goes into the drink, the gun or you? The gun stays where it is. Okay. You climb the 5,000 feet. His hand is steady, the gun still in your back. You cut the throttle and drift for a moment. Then lurch and nose straight down. Through the windshield is the blue water of the Atlantic. You can hear the wind sing louder and louder past the wings. You look at Walsh again. He's pale, but his gun hand doesn't move an inch. At 2,000 feet, it twitches. At 1,000, you stop breathing. The water comes at you like a tidal wave. The plane twists wildly. You pull open the throttle. The wind hits you like a pneumatic drill, threatening to crack the plane wide open. And then, by a miracle, you level off. Okay, Walsh, you win. I... I could have told you. I always do. At the risk of being delightfully corny again, may I say something? What? You'll never get away with this. No? When that boat captain sobers up, he'll get a message to the Coast Guard. You'll be wanted for murder. (laughs) Let me tell you something, Turner. By now, there's nothing left of that ship but splinters. Oh? I guess I forgot to tell you. A friend of mine named Vogel... Sort of a clockmaker. Very handy. Especially with explosives. Explosives? That's right. I planted Mr. Vogel's bomb in the ship myself. Now that old tub is gone. And we, uh, you and I, we were blown apart with it. (laughs) You see, Turner, I I thought of everything. Yeah. Yeah, you sure did.
By nightfall, you reach the west coast of Florida. Finally, Walsh gives you the signal, and you bring the plane down on the smooth water of a lagoon. You taxi as close to the shore as possible and then cut the motor. The plane bobs gently up and down, and you sit waiting. Walsh keeps looking in the direction of a small cottage some 200 yards up the beach. Then at his watch. Well, we're going to wait here all night. I'm going ashore. Wait here. What makes you think I will? <laughs> this, my boy. <laughs> this little valise with half a million dollars in it. Oh? Ever since we left the boat, you've been figuring on some way to relieve me of it, haven't you? Frankly, I have kicked the idea around once or twice. Stop wasting your time, Turner. All you're getting out of this deal is the five grand I promised you. Who knows? When you drop a safe and sound in Mexico, I might be tempted to throw in another five. That's big of you. I'll be right back. Don't uh, go away. I won't, Walsh. I won't. You watch him as he wades ashore, still holding the small black valise. You can see him in the bright moonlight running along the shore. Then he disappears into the trees that surround the cottage. And you wait. Fifteen minutes. A half hour goes by and still Walsh hasn't returned. You slip a wrench into your jacket, ease yourself into the water and start for the shore. A few minutes later, you're hurrying toward the cottage. And you're almost there when the front door opens and you duck into the shadows. The wrench is in your hand, and you wait. Then you hear the footsteps coming along the path, closer and closer. As they reach you, you step out of the shadows, holding the wrench high in the air. Johnny. Diana. Where's Walsh? Back there in the cottage. What happened? What difference does it make? I have the bag. Let's get out of here. Diana, what happened? He... He's dead. I had to do it, Johnny. For us, I had to. There's a half a million dollars here, darling, and it's all ours now. Johnny, wait, where are you going? The cottage, we can't leave him there. Why not? He was supposed to have been blown up with a boat, remember? Well, what are we going to do? We're going to take him with us. We can dump him out in the gulf. Come on. No, Johnny. No, I don't want to go back there. Oh? Here. You can have the bag if you think I'm going to run out on you. All right. Wait here, I'll be right back. You find Walt sprawled on the cottage floor, stabbed to death. The murder knife a few feet away. Quickly, you pick him up and return to the beach where Diana is waiting for you. Then you wade out to the plane. And a few minutes later, you're skimming across the bay, headed toward the gulf. Some 20 miles out, you help Diana open the door. A bright moon rides between broken patches of clouds. With a vicious kick, you help her push the body of Frank Walsh out into space. Its size shrinks like a punctured balloon and disappears into the dark waters of the gulf. You nose the plane up for a steady climb and then level off. Mexico, Johnny. A little more than a thousand miles over the gulf. Mexico with Diana. And a half a million dollars. Johnny. Yeah? I'm not sorry it turned out this way, are you? Why should I be? I got you and a half a million bucks. What more could a guy want? I told you we'd be sitting pretty. And I meant it. Yeah, by morning we'll be in Mexico. We can land this crate, burn it up. No one will ever know. We can start all over like nothing ever happened. And we'll never have to say goodbye again, darling. Never, baby. Never. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a tip to you drivers who have wished there was some way to be sure that the gasoline you're choosing is tops in quality. Check your speedometer. Because in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. Which explains why we're so proud of the fact that throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico, Signal is famous as the go-farther gasoline. Sure, you Signal drivers are enthusiastic about Signal's quicker starting, Signal's faster pickup, and Signal's smooth, knock-free power. 
But remember this. The only way today's signal gasoline can give you that superior kind of performance which you expect of a superior quality motor fuel is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you don't have to guess about it. You see proof of it right on your own speedometer in mileage, the thing Signal Gasoline is famous for. That's why Signal says, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. Yes, it was a lucky break, wasn't it, Johnny? When you accepted Frank Walsh's offer to fly for the Continental Salvage Corporation in the Caribbean. Now Walsh is dead, and you're on your way to Mexico, racing through the night sky over the Gulf with Diana and the small valise containing half a million dollars. You look down at the dark, churning waters of the Gulf, and you feel strangely detached from the world, free of it, free of its laws and its justice. Yes, Johnny, no one will ever think of looking for you. They will all believe you were blown up with the boat chartered by the Continental Salvage Corporation. Thirty-six hours later, you scarcely enter the minds of the Coast Guard officer and the police lieutenant aboard the salvage ship Queen Noriana as they look down in the lifeless body of the murdered radio operator. Well, there he is, just the way we found him. Any identification? Mm-hmm. His radio license, name's Scott. Melvin Scott. Mm-hmm. Oh, we also found this. A letter he was writing to a man named Vogel. Now, let me see. It's about meeting Vogel in New Orleans with a half a million dollars. Yeah. Mm. You should see me play the innocent kid. My own mother wouldn't know me. I found the bomb you gave Walsh. She'd already planted it. I dumped it overboard the first night out. The way I got it figured, Walsh won't try a getaway in the plane to Mexico until tonight. It'll be a cinch for me to get into his cabin and switch bags on him. And I'll have a half million bucks when I meet you in New Orleans. It's really funny, but... Yeah. Looks like the joke was on Scott. He was shot before he got a chance to switch bags. You send an alarm out on this man Walsh, his pilot Turner? Mm-hmm. The whole Gulf area's been on the lookout. But no one sighted them. No one will. You mean Walsh and Turner got away? No, they didn't. I managed to get some information out of the mate with my limited knowledge of German and a lot of gestures. And what's that? The mate saw this radio operator, Scott, around the plane the other night. You can still smell the gasoline in the afterdeck. Scott drained the extra gas tanks. That plane didn't have enough gas to take the more than 100 miles out over the Gulf. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Sidney Renthal and music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Next Wednesday, for a full hour of mystery over most of these stations, tune in a half hour earlier. Enjoy The Saint as well as The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>